On this Wednesday night, could a recession be on the horizon? Consumers and businesses need to be prepared. What rising inflation and rising interest rates could mean for the economy and for you. Reinfection risks. I've got COVID four times while being vaccinated. How it's happening, how to prevent it, and what won't boost your immunity. Rejected. We do not accept your apology. Reaction to the Toronto police chief saying sorry for systemic racism in the force. And the browser getting dragged to the recycle bin. It's after 20 years of being a laughing stock. Why Internet Explorer is being swept into the dustbin of history. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a look at the turmoil in the world economy. The U.S. Central Bank has just raised its benchmark interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point, the sharpest hike in almost three decades. Here's why the U.S. is facing a slowing economy and soaring inflation. The cost of almost everything is going up. U.S. inflation hit a 40-year high of 8.6% in May. And it is not alone. Data compiled by Pew Research shows inflation has risen even faster in many other OECD countries since the pandemic began. Israel tops the list, followed by Greece, Italy and Spain. The U.S. and Canada are closer to the middle of the pack. Inflation has been so low for so long, an entire generation doesn't remember what can happen when it rises and what can happen when interest rates begin to rise too, in an effort to slow down rising prices. Anne Gaviola has our top story on what it means for economic growth and for you. We're strongly committed to bringing inflation back down, and we're moving expeditiously to do so. Tough measures aimed at a tough problem. Inflation in the U.S. at 8.6 percent, leaving central banks in the U.S. and Canada to walk a fine line. The 1970s were a lesson on what not to do. By not acting quickly enough to tackle inflation for years, central bankers were then forced to act aggressively, increasing rates to 20 percent in the early 80s. That pushed North America and most of the world into the deepest recession since World War II. Central banks on both sides of the border signaling they're prepared to do a lot to tackle inflation. But there's a concern that by targeting the rising cost of living, the U.S. could go into a recession and Canada could follow. Bond and stock markets suggest that's in the cards, but economists are divided on whether or not we're headed there. Well, because the bounce back from the pandemic was much stronger in the U.S., the chances of uh, it actually uh, having negative growth for two consecutive quarters is, is, is higher. And that increases, in my view, the possibility, the probability that it could tip into a recession. I don't think the most likely scenario is a recession. Boosting interest rates taps the brakes on economic growth by making the cost of borrowing more expensive for households and businesses and cooling demand. But an economic downturn, which could come this fall, typically takes a toll on employment, household incomes and the housing market. We've already seen a calming of the real estate frenzy that took over during the pandemic with ultra low interest rates. Economists say people who took on variable rate mortgages they may not be able to afford soon is a real concern. So are low-income households that were hit hard by COVID restrictions. Recessions aren't something to fear. It does create a lot of volatility. But at the end of the day, I, I think that the most likely scenario is that we're going to see a slowing in the economy. And it's something that, that consumers and businesses need to be prepared for. The hope is that some sort of slowdown may be the shock the Canadian economy needs and is ready to withstand. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. There are lots of factors beyond Canada's borders driving up inflation, Russia's war in Ukraine and the impact on gas prices, supply chain problems and shortages of labour. Those last two are a lingering effect of the pandemic. Public health restrictions have eased, but people are still getting COVID and increasingly they're getting it more than once. Vaccines certainly reduce the risk of serious illness and death, but as Jamie Marocker reports, reinfection is something we're going to have to get used to. Despite best efforts of many of us, Canadians are coming down with COVID time and time again. I've been vaccinated. I've got COVID four times while being vaccinated. Even our fully vaccinated Prime Minister isn't immune, attending question period virtually while he gets over his second case in six months. We're looking at a probable future where if we're engaging in the kinds of social behaviors we've become used to in the last few years, um, pre-pandemic, we're each looking at two, three, four infections per year. COVID reinfection depends on a couple of things, experts say. 
new mutations being one. Federal data is limited, but the latest information shows while Omicron's BA2 is dominant in Canada, subvariants BA4 and 5 are making gains. In the U.S., those subvariants already account for 21% of infections, and European health officials say they are spreading more rapidly than others. If you were infected with Omicron or any of the subvariants, it doesn't mean that you're good and protected for the next few weeks or months or whatever it is uh, that people think. That brings us to infection immunity. There's a growing list of evidence to suggest Omicron specifically does very little to protect you from catching the virus again. And while COVID is here to stay, experts are still adamant vaccinating the youngest Canadians and boosting the most vulnerable will help, as will strain specific shots and even new nasal vaccines. But if you are still infected, it can help you clear that infection more quickly. And that's the important part, because if you clear the infection, you're less likely to pass it on to somebody else, which is important. And it also gives the virus less chance to replicate in you. Diminishing COVID's ability to evolve, meaning less chance at repeat infection, the effects of which we still know very little about. Jamie Morocco, Global News, Toronto. The U.S. FDA has taken a big step towards approving COVID-19 vaccines for young children. An expert panel is endorsing the use of Moderna and Pfizer vaccines as safe and effective for kids aged six months to five years. That sets the stage for the FDA to green light the shots and they could begin being administered as early as next week. Canada hasn't taken that step, but our National Advisory Committee on Immunization tends to follow the U.S. FDA. Toronto police admitted today what activists in that city have said for a long time, that people of colour are disproportionately targeted by the police and systemic discrimination is real. Here's what the police chief said. We have not done enough to ensure that every person in our city receives fair and unbiased policing. And for this, as chief of police and on behalf of the service, I am sorry and I apologize unreservedly. The force released race-based data on thousands of use of force incidents and strip searches, and the picture the data paints is clear. The question is, what beyond that apology do police intend to do about it? Eric Sorensen reports. That was a plainclothes Toronto police officer about two years ago taking down a suspect forcefully. For many black people, it has always seemed that the police treat them differently. I mean, search. I have been followed around. Jack Goldson has felt discriminated against by the police, he thinks, because he's black. Ever since I came to Canada in the 80s, the same thing, nothing changed. Today, Toronto police admitted systemic racism persists in the force. Their own data from 2020 showing disparities in police encounters with indigenous people, Middle Eastern and other minorities, but the clearest evidence involved black people. Police have found that black people are more than two times more likely to have interactions with police are more likely to have firearms pointed at them and to have force used against them. I apologize unreservedly. An apology and a promise that Toronto Police will do better to address discrepancies in use of force in strip searches and will improve reviews of body-worn cameras. Our goal is to focus our efforts on the systemic bias attributable to our actions. One frustrated activist confronted the police chief in the middle of the news conference. The black community never asked for an apology. What we have asked for you to do is to stop, to stop brutalizing us. Outside, another called for drastic measures. Defunding this police force and reallocating their resources so they can't hurt us like this anymore. anymore. In fact, police budgets are likely to grow as the population grows. Others say long-held prejudices and attitudes must be recognized and addressed. Change your policing policies. Change your training practices. The stereotypes we have picked up over the years. A lot of unlearning needs to happen. Jack Goldson is skeptical that he will ever see real change. Black people does not have a chance with the police. That's the challenge confronting Toronto police with racialized communities, building trust after their own findings confirmed just how serious the problem is with systemic racism in the force. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. 
A recently retired lieutenant general in the Canadian military has been charged with two counts of sexual assault. Trevor Cadieu was under investigation by military police when senior military leadership approved his request to retire. The charges relate to incidents alleged to have happened at the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson has more information. Mercedes? Donna, military police have charged Trevor Cadieu with two counts of sexual assault. The charges stem from an alleged rape dating back to Cadieu's time as a cadet at the Royal Military College in 1994. Royal Military College has been at the centre of a number of allegations, and Louise Arbour raised serious concerns about the college and its culture around sexual misconduct in her report. Kadja is currently in Ukraine, where he's been serving as a senior advisor to the Ukrainian military after suddenly retiring from the Canadian Armed Forces in April. He was scheduled to take command of the Canadian Army last fall, but that reception was quietly shut down just days before it was set to take place after a sexual assault investigation was opened up. There are questions about when senior ranks of the military learned about the concerns around Kadja. Kadja had been promoted to three-leaf general for the job as army commander, and while he never actually worked as a lieutenant general, he did retire as one. In a statement, Kadja said he is returning from Ukraine and will cooperate with the judicial process in Canada. He has previously called the allegations against him false. Military police kept control of the investigation in this case since their work was almost complete, but the case will be tried in civilian court. Donna? All right, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thank you. New aid for Ukraine coming up, the much needed weaponry the US and Canada are promising to send. The United States has pledged to send $1 billion in weapons and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, answering a call from Ukraine's president who says without more heavy weaponry, Russia will keep making gains. The shipment will include anti-ship rocket systems, artillery rockets, howitzers, and a heavy supply of ammunition. When you're in the fight, you can never get, a, get enough and you can never get it quick enough. So, but having said all that, you know, we're going to work hard to make sure we're doing everything humanly possible. We're going to continue to move heaven and earth uh, to get them the capability that they need. Canada was at that NATO meeting in Brussels today and pledged $9 million of military aid in the form of replacement barrels for howitzers and more than 20,000 rounds of ammunition. As Crystal Gamansing reports, Ukrainian forces in the east of the country desperately need everything they can get. And they are defending their homeland with resolve, grit, and ingenuity. With the United States at the helm, 50 supportive countries called the Contact Group came together for the third time, coordinating weapons donations, training and replacement parts to arm Ukraine. They're fighting for the very life of their country. Uh, so your ability to endure suffering, your ability to endure casualties is directly proportional to the object to be attained. Russia released images Wednesday of cruise missiles being fired at Ukraine after the country refused to surrender Severodonetsk. About 80% of that city has been seized by Russian forces. But the industrial zone, including the chemical plant where civilians and soldiers are sheltering, remains under Ukrainian control. Russia, however, is determined to take the eastern region of the country, known as the Donbass. The person who wants to capture everything will never stop after capturing just a part of what he wants. In addressing the Czech parliament, Vladimir Zelensky pleaded for a seventh round of sanctions against Russia as his country awaits delivery of more heavy and long-range weapons. By the end of the month, shipments from Canada and other allied nations will include more howitzer M777s, plus high-mobility artillery rocket systems, which users are being certified on. When you're in the fight, you can never get, a, get enough, and you can never get it quick enough. In the meantime, Ukrainians kiss and hug goodbye, hoping vulnerable loved ones in the East can be taken to safety. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. U.S. prosecutors have filed federal hate crime charges against the accused gunman in last month's mass shooting at a Buffalo, New York supermarket. The U.S. Attorney General went to Buffalo today to visit the memorial. Ten people were killed while shopping at the store that serves a largely black neighborhood. 
Investigators believe the 18-year-old suspect was motivated by the Great Replacement Theory, a racist conspiracy theory that non-white individuals are being brought into the U.S. and other Western countries to replace white voters and achieve a political agenda. The accused has been charged with 10 counts of hate crimes resulting in death, along with a number of firearms offenses and could face the death penalty. Dirty money ahead, the long-awaited report into money laundering in B.C. Sweeping changes are needed to tackle money laundering in B.C., which a public inquiry has concluded has allowed billions of dollars of dirty money to be laundered. And it says the crimes have been poorly understood and largely ignored by law enforcement. The final report of the Cullen Inquiry recommends changes to everything from law enforcement to real estate to banking regulations. Richard Zussman has been unpacking the 1,800-page report. Richard, lots of recommendations, including that BC appoint a commissioner to oversee tackling the problem, because I guess what's in place now clearly doesn't work. It sure doesn't, Don, and a lot of criticism around federal regulations as well. Let me read you one of the first lines. The federal anti-money laundering regime is not effective. Austin Cullen, the commissioner of this inquiry, finding Fintrack's reporting regime is essentially wasteful, and the RCMP had a lack of attention on all of this, so it's led to some really substantial findings. Let me show you some of those. Hundreds of millions of dollars laundered through BC casinos and the housing market. The BC real estate sector is still highly vulnerable to money laundering. Effective regulation of the mortgage lending industry is essential, and money laundering is not the cause of housing unaffordability in this province. There are also some crucial findings. The province should establish an anti-money laundering commissioner, create new provincial money laundering intelligence and investigative units, and increase regulation for mortgage brokers and the real estate industry. I think there was a, um, a lack of will uh, that, um, that underlay uh, BCLC's um, approach to the, the question. And um, it was um, difficult uh, to, for uh, BCLC to deal with uh, some of the issues they had. Richard, the commissioner said much of this takes place in the shadows, but some of it is out in the open. How much blame did the commissioner put on politicians? They found that politicians here in British Columbia, including former Premier Christy Clark knew about suspicious activity and didn't do enough, but fell short of calling these politicians corrupt. And the line of the day, Donna, comes from Attorney General David Eby, saying that it's not enough for him just to put a sash around someone's neck that says not corrupt. He holds himself and other politicians to a much higher standard. All right, lots to watch for. Richard Zussman in Victoria tonight, thanks. People in B.C.'s southern interior are under a flood emergency tonight. Heavy rain in Kelowna has caused at least three creeks to burst their banks, flooding nearby properties. More rain is in the forecast over the next 24 hours, and emergency crews are filling sandbags to protect as many homes as possible and have been inspecting bridges for debris and blockages. In Calgary, the threat of flooding from days of constant rain has now been downgraded, but the city is not out of the woods. Water levels have peaked in the Elbow and Bow River. Both remain under a high stream flow advisory. And conditions can change quickly at this time of year as temperatures rise, potentially triggering a rapid spring melt in the mountains. Whoa. That's the moment a car was hit by a rock slide in Yellowstone National Park. Heavy rain and flooding there caused dramatic damage over the weekend. The new video emerged today as officials say the park's landscape has been dramatically changed. More than 10,000 visitors were forced to flee. Hundreds of homes were damaged. Next, Surfs Over, the Internet's most notorious inconvenience, closes its windows for good. It's not getting any eulogies or tearful farewells, but an influential giant of our times has left us today. The Internet Explorer web browser is officially being retired by Microsoft. As Dan Spector tells us, while some are wishing it good riddance, others are actually feeling a wave of nostalgia. 
Back in a time when your internet browsing session could be ruined by someone picking up the phone, the, the gateway a to a worldwide web. web full of awkward Thanks. MySpace accounts and personal websites under construction internet was Microsoft Internet Explorer. Hattie Partovi is one of the fathers of the storied software first released in 1995. At the time when I was leading the project, I remember thinking this is something that could last forever. But alas, it did not. The official end of its life, June 15th, 2022. Microsoft saying in a blog post, it will no longer support IE. After 20 years of being a laughing stock, um, it's now just sort of being put out of its misery. It went from being one of the best web browsers to being a hated name. You may remember this animation spinning and spinning as your web page loaded or just never did. I was totally clunky. I mean, the internet was clunky, though. In 1998, the Justice Department filed an antitrust suit against Microsoft, describing the bundling of Internet Explorer in Windows 95 as an illegal tie-in. Uh, the next sentence reads, the latest uh, confirmed killer app is the web browser. Do you recall writing that, sir? No. This became this collision about monopoly power and the influence of these larger tech giants on the development of our communications. Internet Explorer's dominance gradually faded until Google's Chrome browser became king. Chrome on my desktop and Safari on my phone. A day to mourn the internet of the past, and as this gravestone posted to a Korean message board says, a moment to honor a browser whose main use ended up being to download other browsers. Dan Spector, Global News, Montreal. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is the Old Time Country Fair held in Niverville, Manitoba last weekend. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.